Saudi Arabia shared one major preoccupation with its neighbor, Iran, the future stability of the Gulf region once Britain withdrew her troops and political presence from the area. For Faisal, a visit to Tehran in 1965 provided a chance for talks with the Shah on the harmonization of their policies. The next year, King Hussein of Jordan paid one of his visits to Saudi Arabia for talks on strengthening the Arab alliance against Israel. And in pursuit of his aim of Muslim unity, Faisal visited Pakistan to see President Ayub Khan, one of a series of visits that led to the setting up of an Islamic pact. Relations with the West, though, were never neglected, and in mid-1966, the King visited President Johnson in Washington, once again pressing for the United States to adopt a more even-handed policy in the Middle East conflict. Although American policy didn't change, Faisal's stature as an international statesman was growing. Shortly before the June War in 1967, he visited France, Belgium and Britain, and in London he was given a spectacular state reception, a far cry from his first visit nearly 50 years before. Special units of the Royal Guard were drawn up in London for a formal review by Faisal and his host, Queen Elizabeth. And throughout the visit, all the British experience of pomp and circumstance was brought to bear. For those who remembered Faisal's visit as a boy prince, the contrast seemed almost beyond belief. The visit underlined Faisal's emergence as a world leader. But with a new war looming in the Middle East, his attention was increasingly drawn back home. He found no difficulty in identifying the source of the conflict. Every problem, he said, was due to the illegal existence of Israel. On June the 5th, the Israelis attacked, defeating Egypt, Syria, and Jordan in the space of six days, seizing Golan from Syria and Sinai from the Egyptians right up to the Suez Canal. With the defeat of Jordan came for Faisal what was the bitterest blow of all. Jerusalem fell into Israeli hands, and with it, the mosques of Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock. Faisal, seen here on a visit to Jerusalem before the war, swore to devote himself to the task of freeing Jerusalem from Israeli control so that he could pray there once again before he died. The first step came with an Arab summit in Khartoum after the war. Faisal first mended ties with Egypt, bringing the Yemen conflict to a close, and then led the way in providing subsidies to the states which had lost territory. That aid has been given unstintingly by Saudi Arabia ever since. At home, Saudi Arabia's own armed forces were built up and today are fully modernized. One branch is the National Guard, newly equipped with motorized transport. The army itself, with armor and infantry branches, is based on the northern border. Ground defense units, equipped with the most modern weapons, are stationed around the towns, military bases, and oil fields. Young Saudi pilots like Prince Bandar, Faisal's son, 
have been provided with modern strike aircraft that not only defend the kingdom, but will have an important role to play in any future Middle East conflict. The real successes of Faisal's diplomacy followed an event in 1969 that shocked the entire Arab world when a fire severely damaged the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Although an Australian was arrested for starting the blaze, most Muslims believe that Israel was to some extent responsible, if only on the grounds of negligence. The storm of protest spread far beyond Jerusalem itself. For the first time in more than a thousand years, Muslim leaders gathered for a summit in the Moroccan capital, Rabat, to discuss their reaction to the Al-Aqsa fire. The summit was the culmination of years of effort by Faisal, and although it reached no concrete decisions, it laid the groundwork for the development of an alliance between the Islamic nations in the years that followed. By 1970, Nasser and Faisal had emerged as the two major leaders of the Arab world, the one with military power and the other with economic power. Their alliance was soon to face a major challenge. In Jordan, a civil war broke out in September 1970 between the Jordanian armed forces and the Palestinian guerrilla movement. In the two weeks of fighting between the army and the guerrillas before a ceasefire went into effect, thousands of Palestinians and Jordanians were killed and wounded. Faisal and Nasser called a special Arab summit in Cairo to bring the two warring leaders together. And it took all their efforts at persuasion before an agreement was hammered out that both were prepared to sign. The cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Egypt stood its first test in an inter-Arab conflict and swiftly proved its worth. For Nasser, though, the strain of the conference proved too great, and shortly after it ended, he died of a heart attack. The passing of President Nasser left King Faisal alone as leader in the region and upon his shoulders fell all the problems of the Arab world, as well as his own tasks of developing Saudi Arabia itself and working for Muslim unity. Somehow, Faisal found the faith and energy to continue, flying halfway around the world to the furthest reaches of Islam in Asia to meet the Malaysian leader, Tunku Abdul Rahman, who shared his own vision of a group of Muslim nations. The Islamic and Arab themes of Faisal's diplomacy always overlapped and rarely more than on a visit to Cairo to see President Sadat in 1971, when the two leaders visited the Al-Azhar Mosque, one of the important centers of Muslim learning.
At the end of 1972, Faisal undertook a major tour of Muslim countries in Africa, beginning with a visit to President Idi Amin in Uganda. From there, he went on to both socialist states like Mali and more traditional countries like Senegal. The tour marked the beginning of a massive diplomatic reverse for the Israelis in Africa. A number of countries broke relations with Israel and were followed towards the end of 1973 by every important independent state on the continent. In that process, Faisal's diplomacy played a key role. The drive for a community of Muslim states was beginning at last to bear fruit. The pressures of office at a national and international level left Faisal with little time for relaxation as king and few of his advisers worked as hard or as long as he did. On rare occasions, though, he was able to take time to indulge the interest in horses he'd had since his youth, though as spectator and prize giver rather than as a competitor. Beside his interest in Arab and Muslim unity, Faisal also turned his mind to the problem of seeking closer relations with the great powers. One visit took him to see Emperor Hirohito in Japan, a country which was displaying an increasing interest in the Arab world, and one which was becoming one of Saudi Arabia's chief trading partners. The visit paved the way for Japan to adopt a more favorable policy towards the Arabs after the October War and also helped to strengthen still further trading relations between the two countries. The key, though, to Faisal's diplomatic strategy lay in the other direction, in the United States, and he returned there in 1971 for talks with President Nixon. American support for Israel was jeopardizing her relations with Saudi Arabia, but there was little sign that this was understood in Nixon's welcoming speech. I know that the talks that we shall have and that the talks that your advisors will have with members of our administration will contribute to the already excellent relations we have between our two countries. And I am particularly looking forward to the opportunity to having the benefit of your wise counsel as one of the senior statesmen of the world on how our two nations can work together for a just and secure peace in the Mideast and in all parts of the world. Faisal, though, spelt out the reasons for tension between the two states in his reply. The tension between America and the Arab and Muslim states, he said, arose directly from the Israeli occupation of Palestine and Jerusalem and from the Israeli aggression against the Palestinian people. Faisal's warning went unheeded, although the time was to come, and soon, when his warnings were to be converted into direct economic pressure. Only in one Western country did he find an ally, in France, which he visited early in 1973. Relations with France, he told his audience, were as good as they could be, and that represented the successful achievement of the policies laid down in the past by his father, King Ibn Saud.
يسير على المخططات التي وضعها جلالة الملك عبد العزيز رحمه الله Whatever the nature of relations with the French, though, it was becoming clear to Faisal that diplomatic attempts to solve the Middle East crisis were far from achieving success. Reluctantly, he, like his fellow Arab leaders, came to the conclusion that other methods must be used. In August 1973, Faisal paid yet another visit to President Sadat, and it was at that meeting that the timetable for the October War was worked out. The military side was left in the hands of Sadat and his Syrian ally, President Assad. But Faisal II had a crucially important role to play. On October the 6th, 1973, Egyptian troops surged across the Suez Canal overrunning the Israeli Barlev defense line and smashing the myth of Israeli invincibility. Away to the north, Syrian troops struck deep into the occupied Golan. The world was taken by surprise and the initiative lay for the first time in 25 years in Arab hands. In Saudi Arabia, Faisal implemented the action of which he had warned for so long. He closed off supplies of oil to the United States and to other countries supporting Israel and went on to carry the other Arab oil producers with him. Arab oil proved to be a potent political weapon and the unity between the Arab states forged during the war was to carry over into the diplomatic campaign that followed it. The oil boycott had a serious effect on the West, and it was a step that Faisal was reluctant to take. When the need arose, though, he took it, and the combination of military power and economic muscle broke the diplomatic logjam in the Middle East. The war was followed by a summit in Algiers, in which the king again played a key role. From its humble beginnings 70 years earlier, Saudi Arabia had become one of the most powerful states in the world, and the figure of its leader burst onto the world stage as an equal amongst the great. Recognition of Faisal's new stature came swiftly. The next year, President Nixon visited Saudi Arabia, the first American president to return Faisal's many visits to the White House. During the last months of his life, Faisal worked unflaggingly to keep up the pressure for a diplomatic settlement of the Middle East conflict, urging Nixon and Secretary of State Dr. Kissinger to persuade Israel to withdraw. Long before his tragic death, Faisal undertook yet another tour through the Middle East, visiting Syria, Jordan and Egypt, promising still more support to their economies, then beginning to recover from the impact of the October War. Faisal threw his immense power and prestige behind the peace efforts, and much of what has been achieved so far is due to his work in rebuilding Arab strength after the June War, and stimulating a sense of Arab unity during and after the October War. In the field of foreign affairs, Faisal left behind him a record of achievement unrivaled by any other Arab leader this century. simple 
austere yet approachable, finding time to listen patiently to even the least among his people. <laughs> the problems of the world, he told this old man, come not from the people. It is the leaders who are responsible. And it is on the leaders, he went on, that the duty devolves of carrying out the laws laid down for man by God. In March 1975, Faisal was assassinated and was succeeded as king by his brother, Khalid ibn Abdul Aziz. With the king's passing, Saudi Arabia entered a new era, yet one where his successors could draw continually on the heritage of his presence as man and as king. His contribution to his people and to the Arab world as a whole was enormous and recognized throughout the globe. Leaders from all over the Arab and Muslim world flew to Riyadh to pay their condolences to King Khaled and to pay their last respects to the colleague and ally who had worked with them so hard and for so long. If the laws of God, on which Faisal based his rule, provide for the improvement of the lot of the people, then Faisal fulfilled them. In the past, the country's cities were old and lacking in facilities, but while viceroy in Jeddah, while crown prince to his brother, and while king, Faisal ensured that Saudi ports, towns, and villages were rebuilt and modernized with all the benefits that modern technology can bring. The substandard housing of the past has become but a fading memory for the Saudi people as new flats, buildings and offices have sprung up all over the country. Communications were modernized, donkey carts giving way to modern cars that reduced journeys of days to trips of hours. To spread education and knowledge and provide entertainment, a Saudi television service was established. Today it reaches into the remotest village and oasis, bringing news about the outside world and making the people yet more aware of their common achievements and common destiny. Making firm pledges for a new $1,200 million fund to help the world. The isolation of the peninsula from the rest of the world has ended forever and it has become a political and economic center for the whole of the Arab region. ...would contribute substantially to the projected international agricultural development. New roads in the remotest regions have brought the benefits of modern medicine to all. In Riyadh itself, the new... ...with a healthy body has come a healthy mind. Education has been expanded and is available for both girls and boys fitting them for the future and building the new generation who will soon take over the running of the country from their parents. Behind all the changes, all the development, the faith of the people in their religion and its values has remained unaltered. They, like their king, have drawn their determination and their confidence in the future from Islam and its holy Kaaba in Mecca. At the height of his power, as in his youth, 
Faisal turned again and again to Mecca to seek the strength he needed for the tasks ahead. From here, the Arabs of old drew the faith that enabled them to conquer half the known world. And from here too, Faisal, boy and man, prince and king, found the inspiration to lead his people from poverty to power and from backwardness to development. Few men have used such power and such opportunities to such effect. <laughs> 